Well, here we are again, folks. This is Brother Peter with um, tidbits from the Word. I've been, uh, of late, looking at a training manual that I have from 1970. I got saved in 1972. Uh, I got saved by somebody evangelizing me. The word evangelist is a proclaimer of the Word of God. Individual evangelists uh, should individually proclaim the Word of God to people. I do this on a daily basis. I evangelize people on a daily basis. Every day, this is what I do. I go out and I speak to individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And I am an evangelist. Uh, will I preach in a church? I have, and not very often, but when I'm called to, I will. But that's not my calling. My calling is to be an evangelist, mainly walking and, and working one-on-one. -on -one. The first evangelists were the disciples. Uh, they walked and they spoke. And wherever they went, they told the story of Jesus and told how salvation worked. And then they won other people to the Lord. And as they won other people to the Lord, other people became evangelists. And uh, actually, Timothy was an evangelist. Um, uh, actually, all of the uh, disciples were evangelists. Even though they were apostles first, they became evangelists. And uh, then Paul was grafted in, and he was the greatest evangelist that ever walked. And he started uh, teaching other small evangelists, like Timothy and Philemon and those other guys that were that had churches, and Titus. He began teaching them how to become uh, permanent evangelist to evangelize from a pulpit to evangelize in a church uh, actually every preacher that proclaims the gospel is an evangelist he's proclaiming that which he needs to excuse me this is not a theory it's a fact uh, these are not uh, ideal or uh, speculations or ivory towers but they attested results of hard experience real experience uh, first in the congregations of churches and then uh, uh, out on the street our preachers day is just beginning when he preaches a message the message he preaches is one thing but his day is just beginning. He is to evangelize out of sight of the pulpit. He is to be an active evangelist. He can't really be a preacher if he's not an evangelist. Well, what is an evangelist? One who is a person who says what he believes to somebody else and what the Bible says. That's evangelizing. Uh, we got all kinds of training programs for lay people. What is a lay person? That is a person who is called of God, who is not necessarily schooled in a college or a public school. I've been evangelist since I was saved in 1972, November 5th, at 3 o'clock in the morning. On uh, By November 10th, I was back up to a jailhouse where I had been and apologizing to the jailer that I had been put in that jail a few days before and that I would like to come in and speak to the men that are in that jail about my experience. The jail happened, jailer happened to be a woman at the time and she gave me permission. Come on, I'll let you in. So the following week, I was in there, standing there with a the Bible in my hand. 
I couldn't even read. I had to learn how to read after I got saved. I opened the Bible at the places where God had showed me what he had done for me and proceeded to tell the fellows. And one guy said to me, he said, Hey, fellow, if you can't read any better than you're reading, you need to hang it up. You ain't going to make it. And I said to him, Can you read? And he said, I can. I said, I'm going to tell you what scriptures to read, and then I'm going to tell you what those scriptures say. I had already, after salvation, learned when God said something, what he said. The Bible became an open book to me. Whatever I read, I understood. It was amazing. So I proceeded and got the Bible on record. And I put the records on and I put my headphones on and I listened to the Bible being read through by, uh, I believe it was Alexander Scott, but it read on record. And um, so until they came out on tape, I gave it a record, excuse me, and uh, so uh, I learned how to read that way. I got a family Bible, I've got it right up here somewhere, and I started underlining it, and I underlined it and I read it through, and underlined it through, but I listened to it on record, and I began to learn what the Bible said, and then the more I learned what the Bible said, I really realized what my layman duty was, was to go out and tell other people. Uh, and I started strategically at home. I walked my street and told people I, my testimony, how they could be saved. Then I walked other streets. Then uh, God had me go down and join a small little church at the time was a little bitty uh, block building painted all different colors they had used second hand block to put it up and uh, I joined that little church I got baptized and uh, set out in God's program to be an evangelist and have been one ever since uh, training I had none uh, this church, we decided uh, not long after I got there to start a bus ministry. Well, we didn't have a bus. And I was uh, the candidate to see about getting one. So a couple other fellows, they went to a big bus place in Tennessee somewhere. Next thing you know, they come rolling in with an old junk school bus. And uh, needed uh, repair. So we took it to my house, we jacked it up on blocks, we took all four wheels off it, and uh, proceeded to putting all new brakes on it, checking out the muffler system, checking out the motor. We had a, another guy in our church, his name was James Walls. Oh, James, he checked the motors out. He checked all the motor, the transmission, the rear end, checked it all out, doped it out, and changed the fuel, changed the oil, uh, made sure the thing was going to run. Uh, we taped it up, and me being a painter at the time, still am a painter, uh, we taped all the windows up, taped it up, and this, the color was decided at the church that it was going to be a, a dark blue. So we painted the thing dark blue, and lettered it, Oakside Baptist Church, bus number one. Before we were done, if my mind correctly, I don't, I can't remember if it was five or seven, but we had several bus routes. So God put me evangelizing street to street, picking up people, getting the bus load. <coughs> I like to brag, and it might not be true, and it might be true, that I carried about 32 people on an average to church. And I believe that um, that number might be exaggerated a little bit, but I believe that I carried from between 15 and 32 most of the time on that bus. 
Well, what did it take to do that? It took evangelizing. It took evangelism. I had to get out and knock on doors. Tell people that I would be around Sunday morning and I would pick them up. And that's what a lay preacher is. And that's what I was, an evangelist, to evangelize the world. We have endeavored, since I've been saved, I have endeavored everywhere I went to evangelize. What are the basic principles that I've used to evangelize with? I've used the scripture in the New Testament that said, Go ye into all of the world and proclaim. Now, Brother Peter, how do you go into all the world? I have been on many mission trips, but that's not what I'm considering going into the world. The best way is a man says, he comes to our church and he says, I have been called to a certain country. Would you back me? Yes. Put some money in the offering plate? Yes. And back me on a monthly basis? Yes. He is a world evangelism, evangelizer. And he's gone out, given his life up here, and gone to a place of, away from his country, away from his family, away from his home, away from everything. Gone to a place where he can evangelize. Christ's first instruction to his new followers. In the first chapter of Mark, we see, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. His last instructions on the earth to his disciples were, But you shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be, that shall is a will, you will be, witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, that's your hometown, and in Judea, that's the county you live in, and in Samaria, that's the next county and next towns. And under the uttermost parts of the earth, and that's what I'm doing on the YouTube, the uttermost parts of the earth. And couldn't do that before I got on this because I couldn't go. I had been to Mexico a few times. What little bit I did there was good, but it wasn't permanent. I left permanent words and everything, but I didn't stay there. God didn't make me to be a missionary. He had a mission for me right here in the city and the state where I live, and I'm just now entering in to a, a firing up a new, a new, a new thing that we're going to work and bring into fruition to build the body of believers back up in our church. The first and most obvious principle is that the church is the body under order by Christ to share the gospel with the whole world. We start with the church. If you're a free agent, never been in a church, now not in a church, and you call yourself an evangelist, you've missed the basics. You should have an organization, church organization, backing you if no other way but morally. Saying, I believe he lives what he says, I believe he does what he lives, and I believe that he's true. You need a group that can say that about you. And so that you don't get off, way off in a bad place in life. Let's look at one of these things. We're fighting a war. We war against the principalities and powers of this world. There's no doubt in my mind is what the outcome would be if we were not engaging in this war for spirituality, for
for Christianity. It would be total anarchy, which is what we're, we're fastly coming to that in the United States of America. The vast majority of Christian church members today are sitters. They're takers. They take root in their seat. And many of them try to take preeminence uh, in the church when they do nothing. They do nothing. Uh, many of them don't even tithe. What is tithing? Tithing is the first thing that you learn when you get saved. The very first Sunday, I walked into a church. I gave 10% of what I made that week. Could you afford to do that, Brother Peter? I sure couldn't. I sure couldn't. But I also found out this, that I could not, not afford not to. So what happened? Well, I tithed. And that tithing perhaps, and, and I can't recall if it was, was probably part of the food money or whatnot. And somebody uh, came alongside and said, um, How many children you got, Brother Peter? I got six. Well, we got this freezer full of food. Wonder if you could use it. <laughs> I said, I believe I could. So God said, put your little 10% in there, your little $20, where you made 200 that week. So you put $20 in there, and the man gave you a freezer full of food. You couldn't have bought for $20. So God has always, 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 since 1972, November 5th, met the need of my family and myself. Clothes-wise, do you think it's bad that a man offers you his wardrobe says, I'm getting a new wardrobe. Here's my closet full. It looked like it all fit you. Here's my closet full of my wardrobe. We're going to update. Wow. You just got enough clothes to wear for the next two, three years. You're not buying a thing. Wow. And God will meet the need of every single person that works for Him. We must firmly take root. Our minds must be permanently endowed with the Word of God. We must get into the Word and stay because the battle is for the souls of men. One soul in my whole lifetime, if one soul gets fed from hell, it's worth my whole lifetime. For one, one soul. It would be worth my whole lifetime. There is a word that goes along with evangelism. A word that's very much disliked in this world today. A word that some people are disdained with it. The word is work. W-O-R-K. It is work to be an evangelist. But it's rewarding work. It's blessed work. It's work that gives you the freedom to be able to feel like you're doing what you're supposed to do. And that's what I like about that. Acts 8 and 4, where it says, All they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere preaching the word. That's what started the early church. That's what made things work. <laughs> What's well, amazing? God put a, a peoples in front of me somehow when I first started the jail ministry in 72, 73 up to 83. Ten years I was in there before the system got changed and they 
deemed that it was uh, uh, evading the rights of the people in jail for a preacher to come up and preach when they didn't particularly want him to. And his rights, even though he was in jail, were that he didn't have to hear that preacher if he didn't want to. And the way the jail system was set up, when I went up to preach, there wasn't any choice. They had to hear me, whether they wanted to or not. And I, and I was uh, able to do that for, t for nearly 10 years, eight, eight years I believe, I was able to do that on a regular basis. Well look in this Acts 8 and 4, they were all scattered abroad and uh, started putting the word out and started translating, started preaching the word. They went to different places where, if they were Greek, and they were in a place where they weren't Greeks, they had to translate or they had to do different things. So what we have today is we have people who study other languages and go out and evangelize in other places. The results of evangelism was that there was a church started. Uh, and this is how the Church of Jesus Christ has accomplished what it's accomplished since the cross. Uh, if everybody in the church was evangelizing, was preaching the word, was when they leave the church, if everybody was evangelizing, next Sunday our church would be, you wouldn't be able to pack them in. If everybody evangelized somebody this week, brought them to church, I, I have uh, this Sunday planned, I have a, a, a new neighbor, he, his brother, his wife, and three children. That's three, four, five, six. I'll have six going to church with me this Sunday. Brand new people. Just came in the area from Texas. And they'll be going with me. Have another family that is uh, on the other end of the street who just came in. I visited them and, and find out they're from Texas. And they would like a place to worship. And so I plan on seeing them, two girls and a woman. The husband's gone back to work in Mississippi. I plan to see them in church. And if, if we're going to be evangelists, if we're going to carry that name, we need to do it. We need to prove it. We need to prove what we say we are. We must have the power of God on us in order to do this. You can't do it on your own. I, in a little book I was reading, it said that there are millions of barbarians I was one for 30 years, meaning I didn't believe in God or the church. I was, if you uh, please, a pagan in a way that I believed alcohol was the answer to take me out of my misery and my problems when it only made more. So I was an alcoholic. Came to the uh, place of being suicidal a few times in my life. Uh, the bottle will let you down. And when it's empty and you haven't got another one and can't get another one, you're in trouble. If that's what your God is. And mine was. Little by little, there was a division between clergy and laity, evangelism and professional preaching and, and professional training. This was a, a, Brother Kennedy said this was a deplorable situation. that the clergy would not back the laity 
that is called to be an evangelist, not a preacher in a church. There are two or three reasons why God never made me a preacher. One reason was I wouldn't be acceptable because I've got about a, I actually graduated the eighth grade, but I, I graduated with about a sixth grade education. And I don't have the paperwork to back what they want to see in a preacher in the church. I got news for you. The preachers in the first churches didn't either. <laughs> but they did know Christ and they did have spiritual backing. The second important principle is that laymen as well as ministers must be trained in evangelism. I'm a self-trained evangelist. Why? Because I come from the state of Maine. The people in Maine believed if you had something to do, you learned how to do it. Did you need firewood? You learned how to do it. Cut it. You need shingles on your roof? You learned how to cut some of that firewood into shingles and you put them on your roof. You learn how to put them on. It, most houses in Maine when I was a young man had wooden shingles on the roof, wooden shingles on the side. Uh, what'd you do for windows? Well, most of the people I knew built their own house. And when they would build their own house, if they could, they went and bought a new window, but the average person didn't. They found an old window. In a, from an old house somewhere and made it fit and built it, built around it and that's what they had for windows in their house and so that was where I grew up I grew up in a place where if you wanted something or you needed something you built it or you made it or you cut it out uh, when you were sawing uh, sawing by hand firewood with a cross cut with a handheld saw. I had a wooden frame with wire in it. I sawed firewood. One of the farmhouses we lived in when I was a young man, we used 16 cords of wood in the winter. 16 cords. A cord is 4 by 8. 4 feet high, 4 feet wide, and 8 feet long. Now they do cords by weight. And cords have got smaller and smaller, but a cord is 128 uh, square feet of wood, which is a lot of wood. And we didn't have a truck. My dad didn't have a truck. Had an old station wagon. Whenever we moved to a place and stayed there long enough, if we could get wood from the back, we did. If not, We'd take the old station wagon, we'd go up and we'd climb trees. We couldn't hardly fall a tree on somebody else's property, but you could climb a tree with a huge limb sticking out, cut the limb off, cut the limb in pieces big enough to get them in the back of the wagon to get them home, uh, pull them out, put them on these saw benches that we made, and saw them off with the handsaw. Was that work? Yes, in a sense. Was it a chore? Yes, in a sense. Was it fun? Yes, it was, in a sense. I never begrudged sawing wood. It was a necessity. <laughs> if you didn't saw wood, you froze to death. Uh, you had a choice. You could saw wood or freeze to death, whichever one you chose. And you can see I chose not to freeze to death. So therefore, much of our time was cutting wood and spent and then in the winter time in Maine you had to bank your house go somewhere and get sawdust and put it up around the house two or three feet high then you go get uh, bow limbs off from, off from uh, spruce trees 
bring those limbs over and put them on top of that sawdust all the way around the house. And then when the first snow came, the first snow would lay on top of those boughs and then it would freeze. And when it froze, it made a canopy on those boughs. And what heat that you had coming up from the basement or in the house kept the house at like 68 degrees inside. So you had a warm house. And so that was part of growing up. Now evangelism's like that. What is cut what is evangelism? You talk about cutting wood to keep from freezing to death. Well evangelism is reading the Bible so that you can pass it on. Evangelism is studying the work so you can pass it on. Jesus gave some apostles in that day. Those were those who saw him and were with him. Some prophets. Those were some of the apostles who did prophesy. Some he gave evangelism. He gave them evangelism. And to some pastors. And to some teachers. Now I'm an evangelist and a teacher. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Equipping the saints under the work of the ministry. And upbuilding the body of Christ. This is my job. I am working with young boys. Who one day are going to be young men. Who one day are going to be older men. And they're going to be in the system. And I am training them to not leave the rudiments of the first principles. The first thing we need to learn as a newborn babe, as coming into the church, is the Ten Commandments. You say, but Peter, those are Old Testament. Those are the rules. By the way, there's not one law. There's not a law in the United States that you can't go back to one of the commandments. Every law in the United States, you go back to one of the commandments. Now they're trying to do away with the Ten Commandments. The Supreme Court's trying to get you to take them off the wall, take them out of the schools. They are too, they take them out of schools. They're replacing them with guns. They're replacing the Ten Commandments with guns and knives, with uh, rapes in the school. Where a young lady can be sitting on the steps in the school and a man, young man can come up and literally rape her in public and nobody says anything. And, and this is what took the place, this taking the place of the Ten Commandments. What's taking the place of the Ten Commandments? Guns and knives? Swearing, cursing? I heard this year the school's fixing to start in our uh, uh, area in uh, a week or two and as this guy says he is a satanist has a satan church <coughs> and he plans to activate his satan church in the school and they can't stop him because that's his right that's his satanic religious right yet a christian doesn't have a right to take his bible in there today or take his ten commandments in there today and teach the morals that were written down in our Constitution through the Ten Commandments and by the Ten Commandments. And this is where we are. Yes, evangelism is important. It's probably the most important thing right now <coughs> in the United States of America. People aren't getting fed from the pulpits. From those who are preachers who are preaching in the pulpits are afraid to preach the word because they're afraid the government might come after them <clears throat> because they invoke something against somebody else's idea or belief. It took one woman to get the Bible out of the schools. It took one man with a perversion who had a sexual change became a transsexual 
to be able to write a rule that the Constitution, the, the, the uh, members of the Supreme Court backed up that it was evading his right because he had changed himself from a man to a woman that he should have a right being in a man's body to walk into a woman's bathroom and cause the rest of the United States to have to adhere to that rule for that one man. That's improper and and wicked. And I got news for you, man. I'm supposed to be talking about evangelism. Let me get off that subject. The fifth principle after salvation that was talked about was soul winning. Go out and win souls. Study to show thyself approved a workman. Need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. Study to show thyself approved. And then you become a workman. You got these five things before you become a workman. You become a workman. And you go out. And you evangelize and you win souls. You tell them the basics of what you learned. Salvation was first. Learning what the book says. To be a motivated Christian. Reviewing the history. And right now I'm in, in a, a college. And we're fixing to do American history. And reviewing the history of the Bible history and religious history in the United States of America. If we have this knowledge, we can do away with the fear of witnessing. There's a fear when you first get saved in witnessing, unless you get all the way in. Like I got all the way in, I didn't have a fear. My first thing was to go out and try to win the buddies that I had, that I drank with every night for years. I had a life-changing experience when I got saved. And I pass on that life-changing experience to others. If I fail to do that, I failed as a Christian. It is our duty to win others. What is the missing link in today's churches? They talk about the missing link all the time in, in things. Well, we got a link that's missing in churches today. It's called soul winning. Uh, the lightning before the thunder. The lightning before the thunder. That's the man. Go out. Like lightning. And bam. Tell somebody about Jesus. And then the thunder takes place. The guy gets it. And he said, yeah. yeah you know, how do I do that, Pete? I say, you saved Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and save my soul. And God will save you. Person to person. Person to person. The basis. First by some here from the pastor. Some here from evangelists. And then taking that person that you want to the Lord and lead them into individual study. And then do something if you can, if possible. Get them in with yourself and two or three others or get them into a body of believers, a church, as quick as possible. And, and, and then you can start uh, doing something so they can grow. Ah. Paul said to some people. That were supposed to be doing that. He said I'm afraid of you. Lest I have bestowed on you labor in vain. He had showed some people. 
himself as an evangelist. He had showed them what to do. And he came back and found them not doing it. And he said, hey, I'm scared. I'm afraid of you guys. You, you're not doing what I told you. You're gathering up in a group here and, and bunching up and not getting out, not telling others. It's important that not just two or three you gather together and get your own little clique. That's, that's a bad thing. We need a training program for evangelists, and I've been in one now for years. It's called on-the-job training. <laughs> on-the-job training. Uh, do you know you got to sow a seed before you get a tree. And then when you got green fruit, you got to wait until it's ripe before you pick it. So we're seed sowers. I sow a seed. I sowed seed in some people. Then I see them again a year later. And I can see they're becoming a tree. And that when you're a tree, a new tree, and you get new fruit, you got green fruit. And if you pick it too soon, you can't eat it. And if you pick it too soon, more than likely it's going to rot rather than ripen. So you have to be careful when you're out doing fruit work with new trees. That you don't try to make them yield fruit before their time. And then the fruit gets picked and then it's spoiled. So you must work. Basic training is an essential thing which we are training to teach our people how to get into the gospel first for themselves and find out where they are spiritually and then, and then how to present the gospel to another. And this is how you train evangelists. This is how you train yourself. How to bring the person into saying or the commitment to Jesus Christ that I do believe I'm a sinner. If you can show a man he's a sinner, as our little tribe says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's up to us to do that. The field is the world. And the field is white under harvest and has been for, for many, many years. Uh, the presentation of the gospel should be brief, can be quick. I've presented the gospel before, spoke to a young lady, Asked her if she wanted to ask Jesus to save her, and she said yes. I said, let's do it now. She bowed her head and said, Jesus, I want you to save me. I'm, forgive me of my sin, come over and save my soul. Then looked back up and handed me my receipt, because I'm standing at the cash register in the line in the Kroger store, and just won the little cashier to the Lord. Are there people behind you? Yes. They've got no idea what's going on. We were talking close and private, like while we were exchanging things and got a convert. A good question is, do you know if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? Wow. 60 seconds. 60 seconds you can win somebody to the Lord if the Spirit's right. You ask God to show you that one that is the closest to coming in. That you've been, God's been dealing with them and they're ready but somebody hasn't said something to them and you're the somebody. And you tell them the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. 
and show them how they can get that gift. And then God said to you and I, the evangelists, be ye perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we can show that person the same thing we found out. One day I was a sinner. And but all things were made perfect by the glory of God. And then by grace we're saved through faith, not of works, as any man should boast. All I said at 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972, drunk. God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. And they did. And, and the problem went behind me that I had. Do you know that from that day to this, I've never, ever taken one drink of alcohol or desired to? Do you know I've not swore one cuss word or desired to? From that day to this, that was true salvation. This is what the Bible says about God. We know that God is merciful. And we know He's a loving God. Should have killed me and sent me to hell. For 30 years, I cursed him, swore, and, and lied and cheated and, and did all those things for 30 years. And he spared me. And that's why I see today him sparing some people. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And God came down in human flesh. He came down and presented his self and his son, Jesus. Listen. The Christian, the God-believing person is the only person in the world that can be saved. We serve the only God that went to the cross and died, shed his blood for you and I, that we could enter in to the gates of heaven. All we like sheep have gone astray. Ah, uh, there's not one of us who have turned. Every one of us have gone our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all were going opposite, the opposite way of God. And the Bible placed all of the sins that ever were committed and ever would be committed on his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. He took all the sin of the world, all of it. God imputed or laid upon Christ our sins. Even now, B.C. 2016, and all our sins were put on him. He purchased this place for us in heaven through the shedding of his blood. It was a gift. Eternal life is a gift from God. You can't earn it. Oh, you can do right, but you can't earn it. It was by grace, through faith, that you and I get this eternal life. And it is uh, through grace and faith that this eternal life was given to us to keep. It's not something we keep. It's something He keeps. If we try to be too intellectual, we'll find that we leave Christianity behind and, and become bad, bad um, witnesses. Faith is trusting in Jesus by faith and faith alone. If you're trying to work your way to heaven, you're not going to make it. If you try to do anything to hold or keep your salvation other than believe that Jesus can keep it, you're in trouble. You say, what if I sin? You will sin. I listened to a message earlier today and the man said, one of the greatest men I've ever believed and one of the best Christians I've ever been around. He said, I will sin and I will sin every day more than likely. A sin of omission is a sin. Omitting to speak to one person that God said to speak to. A sin is our commission. 
Why do I do what I do? Because the love of Christ constrains me to do it. The greatest story ever told, the greatest story that ever was put on earth was the redemption of Jesus Christ to anybody that will come. We have basic uh, essentials in a Christian life after being saved. And one is to tell others what happened to us. You don't have to go to school to do that. You don't have to go to seminary to do that. You don't have to even know how to read and write to do that. You don't have to learn verbs and pronouns and nouns and adjectives and all that kind of stuff to do that. The simplest thing that you can do is tell somebody what happened to you. That's the simplest thing. The main reason for our existence after salvation is to tell somebody else about Jesus. I found the vast majority of people that you meet today don't seem to have an idea what's going to happen to them when they die. They hear the word hell, they hear it in cursing. They hear the word Christ, they hear it in cursing. But to join the two together, that Christ is the one that keeps you from going to hell, they don't hear that part. They had people taking the name Jesus in vain. They had people taking the name frivolously hell during the day and using that word. But to put the two together, Christ is the redeemer from hell. And he will redeem those who will say, I believe, Jesus, you are the redeemer, and I believe I am a sinner, and I'm on my way to hell. And I want you to forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul, and he'll do that. These things have I written, that you may know that you have eternal life. When Jesus wrote his book, the Bible, he wrote it that we may have eternal life. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Romans 6 and 23 says that God loved the world, and his way is different than the way of the world. But the end thereof of the way of the world is death. What death is it talking about? This is a warning that the death he's talking about is going to be in hell fire, yes. And that's going to be bad. Where the worm dieth not, that means the soul can't die and he'll squirm in that fire. What is the worst part of that, Peter? The worst part of that is, is total separation from God forever, never having the opportunity again to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, come in your heart and save your soul. You have passed grace. When you get in hell, you passed grace. And you passed by the favor of God by rejecting it. God's way is through grace and faith. The wages of sin is death. Not physical death, but separation from God forever. And that's what he's talking about. God's eternal life is life forever. And to not have Jesus Christ in your heart when you die, you go to hell forever and separation forever. Christ said that there would be few that find the way and many that go into the way of destruction 
According to God's word, man has made a mess of everything he's put his hands to. And we have as men. We have done that. And the results of sin is taking people to hell today. He said they are all gone out of the way, Romans 3.11. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, Romans 3 and 12. None. And because the world does not understand the way of God. For the sin separates him from God. And the only way you can do can get to God is say, God, I need you to wipe this sin away from me. And he'll do it. So last but not least, not by works of our righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest any man boast. When God saved me, he saved me through faith, and I was saved through faith at 3 o'clock in the morning, drunk. If I can get saved at 3 o'clock in the morning, drunk, you can get saved anywhere, anytime. If you've been listening to Brother Peter, <coughs> all you need to do is say, Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart to save my soul. Go to the Dollar Tree and get a Dollar Tree Bible. Make sure it's a King James Version. One dollar buys you a paperback Bible, King James Version, from the Dollar Tree. <coughs> and buy that little Bible and start reading it. Get in the New Testament and read what Jesus said in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke, in John. But in John, you'll find that's a good book to start studying in. And ask God to show you what it says. Well, this is Brother Peter saying goodbye. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.